Hello, I'm Andrea Bordenka. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Generative Leadership USA. At the Institute for Generative Leadership, we enable leaders and coaches to create the habits that allow them to step into their full power. I am happy to present Power Woman Hour with Amy and Michelle, where they're engaging in a very important conversation around financial planning and financial stability for women. Enjoy the conversation. Hi, I'm Amy Jamrog, President and CEO of the Jamrog Group. Hi, my name is Michelle Ransom. I'm the Agency Investment Specialist at Mass Mutual's Charter Oak Insurance Office. We're here today to talk with you about the 10 most common things that women tend to overlook when it comes to planning and money. So Michelle, I, I find that the number one thing that women tend to overlook is not saving enough money. You know, when we think about women make less money than men, typically, and women statistically save 10% of their income while men tend to save 11%. That 1% doesn't seem like a lot, but when you take that 1%, combine it over time with less income, and then compound it between now and retirement, that gap is significant. So when we think about what's the solution, for us, you know, as financial advisors, the solution is, first and foremost, wherever you can, automate your savings. So using technology, automatically enrolling in a 401k plan, automatically increasing that contribution every year, the things that can systematically happen to make a difference for you in terms of your saving. That would be the, the first thing I would say. The second is pay yourself first. And I know it's easy to say when you have so many competing goals, but paying yourself first, using the technology to be able to do that where it will automatically save little bits of money for you, automatically invest it for you. It sounds like a small step, but all these small steps really do compound to make a big difference. And I think one of the things that the pandemic has taught us, taught everyone, is an emergency fund. Sure. You know, how many times we've heard this past year, I wish I would have saved, I wish I would have planned, I wish I would have had six months or nine months of a backup. And people never really anticipate what would be a, a reason for needing that much savings? Why would myself and my spouse be out of work for an extended period of time? And the pandemic showed us that this is the very reason why an emergency fund is so important. And one of the areas also, when we think about some of the common overly, overlooked ideas or overlooked items for women in financial planning, one of the areas is really carrying too much debt. When we think about the differences between men and women in carrying debt, Generally, women carry more debt than men. In fact, when we think about things like student loan debt, women typically carry about two thirds more debt than men do. And one of the reasons for that is because more women graduate from college, both undergrad and graduate. So when you think about the concept of women graduating from college and having more debt, and then when you think about when they enter the workforce, entering the workforce typically women make about 73 cents on the dollar compared to our male counterparts. And so that can really create a recipe for when we enter into or exit the workforce and really try to build our savings, it can really become a challenge in terms of having that free cash flow and being able to save comfortably for retirement. One of the other areas when we think about student loans is we often think about this delineation between good debt and bad debt. So we'll hear that term quite often. Well, good debt is, can really be perceived as things that build equity on your credit, something like a mortgage perhaps. Whereas bad debt is often looked at as things that could be high interest rate credit cards, things that don't typically build equity for you. And one of the challenges about bad debt is that not only are they characterized by having high interest rates, so you're paying more over time, but also when you think about how that affects your credit score, they often have a more adverse effect on your credit score. So those are some of the things when we think about oversights and some of the ways that we can improve our financial planning. It's about getting a concept of good debt and bad debt. And how do we plan for the solution for that? Well, one of the ways that we can plan in terms of good debt, bad debt, and really making sure that we're budgeting. 
So budgeting is an excellent way when you think about getting very clear on what's coming into the household in terms of income and what's leaving the household in terms of expenses. By differentiating our expenses, we'll be able to really look at our cash flow and be able to perhaps eliminate some of those expenses that may not be serving us. Another thing I see women really overlooking is underestimating and not planning for future healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. And this can be really detrimental to a retirement plan, but for so many people, it feels very far off that they don't really think they need to deal with it now. And so we see um, women over time pay more for their health insurance, they pay more for long-term care expenses, and we tend to live longer. So when you take longevity and higher expenses and then not planning for that, it really, really can hurt a retirement plan. The other thing when we think about long-term care, women tend to care for their spouses, spouses predecease them, and then they're left having to deal with their own care. I hear this all the time from my female clients who say, and I don't want my kids having to carry the burden of taking care of me. Well, what's the solution, right? You've got to outsource it somewhere and outsourcing it can be expensive. So the earlier you plan for buying long-term care insurance, perhaps buying life insurance, prepaying for your funeral. I mean, these are, are difficult conversations for people to have but far less difficult to have them when you're younger, healthier, and these options are available for you rather than waiting until you're into retirement, you've got health issues, and then these options are not options anymore because you find yourself uninsurable or the cost of starting too late becomes too burdensome. So buying insurance early on, working with an estate planning attorney to look at the overall plan, and of course, working with a financial advisor to kind of map out these priorities and figure out what's the best way to afford to take care of them. The other common oversight when we think about financial planning is this concept of cultural differences when it comes to insurance and whether or not there are any social stigmas or cultural stigmas associated with planning. And when we think about also women in the United States and how that may differ from women abroad, and what we have to factor in and think about when we think about planning and insurance. Those are all things that we have to factor in and think about in terms of stigmas associated with insurance. And so what's the solution with that? The takeaway here is that really, no matter one's culture, race, background, financial planning is important and it's beneficial for everyone. Knowledge is power. And, some, and if we can break down some of these cultural barriers and be able to expand the dialogue around proper planning, then we'll be able to help empower women and it will really transcend against any different culture so that we can really help women to understand the need and the importance of insurance planning. Absolutely. You know, we get the question all the time too, when do you need a financial advisor? And what I find is that women wait longer to engage in the conversation with a financial advisor because they don't think they have enough money or this really interesting, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, but this concept that because you can Google the information, you should be able to figure it out yourself, right? So the, the information is readily available, but if you Google financial planning or you Google retirement planning, you know, the millions and millions of hits that you're going to get can be totally overwhelming. Or ask the person at work, you know, someone they trust to say, hey, what are you, do are you doing? So. You know, every once in a while, I'll come across a, a portfolio. There was someone's 401k allocation, and I'll say, you know, interesting choices here. How, how did you pick these funds? And she'll say, well, you know, one of the guys at work seems pretty smart, so I asked him what he has, and I did what he did. Except he's 20 years older than you with a completely different financial picture. The investments weren't really appropriate for her, and so. When we think about working with a financial advisor, right, what's the solution? And I think if you have income, if you can save some amount of money every month, and if you have goals, you probably should be engaging with a professional and working with an advisor. So how do you even begin? There are a lot of us to choose from. Like there's, there are a ton of financial advisors out there. Each of us specialize in different areas. And what I would say to anyone asking this question is look around, ask for a referral from someone you trust, ask your attorney, ask your accountant, ask a successful friend. Who is it that you work with? 
then interview that person for you and make sure that that person, smart as they might be, make sure that they're the right fit for you. And you know, we as women have intuition and trust your gut, right? Sure. Trust your gut. If in that conversation, in that interview, it doesn't feel comfortable, you don't think the person's listening to you, you're not sure about the person's experience or credentials, or they're reluctant to answer your questions, if it doesn't feel comfortable from the very beginning, it's probably not going to get better. And because there are so many people from whom to choose, I always say, keep looking until you feel in your gut you found the right match for you. Sure. Great point, great point. And particularly when people feel comfortable with their financial advisor, they're more inclined to take their suggestions. They're more inclined to stay on track and follow that plan. So that's a great point. The next item is women tend to be more conservative with our investments. Uh, traditionally, when you think about women, we generally start to save a little bit later. And when we do start to save, we save less. And we're more inclined when we do start to save to invest more conservatively. And so what's the challenge with that? The challenge with that is that by starting later, and the fact that, again, women typically earn less than men, and we're more conservative, that creates this disparity where we may not be able to grow our assets large enough to be able to suit what we need in retirement because of our conservative nature. One of the other challenges that that can present is when we talk about conservative investments, not only may they not grow as, as much as we want them to over time, but we also have to contend with things like interest rate risk. The more conservative that an investor is, the more they are likely to be invested in fixed income vehicles like bonds. And the challenge is that when you're in tough interest rate environments, then you have that coupling of low interest rates and then perhaps even negative uh, portfolio values when interest rates go up. So that's one of the common challenges when you have too conservative of an investor. Also, when we think about inflation, when we think about the concept of inflation, we often talk about the price of goods or services that are increasing around us, but also when we think about retirement planning, the cost of health care you mentioned earlier. Really, the cost of health care ex is exceeding at an alarming rate. And so by being too conservative with our investments, we run into that challenge of perhaps not being able to grow those assets over time to be able to afford the things that we need in retirement. And so what's the solution for this, for becoming too conservative? Well, we can't stress it enough that working with a good financial professional, one that understands your needs, your objectives, is really going to be paramount. Because often we find that even though a client may innately want to be conservative, by having that dialogue with a good financial professional and understanding why they may want to take on a little bit more risk to account for the things that they need to, oftentimes clients are a little bit more apt to step out along that yield curve, or that risk curve, if you will because they're going to feel more informed and more empowered about making decisions. The two words that constantly come to mind, clarity mm. and confidence, right? And when someone feels insecure about money, not sure where to turn, usually it's either lack of clarity and or lack of confidence and lack of clarity leads to a lack of confidence. So one of the areas I, I often see, I know we've talked about this is Sometimes women don't get involved in the household finances. Mm -hmm. They defer to a husband or a spouse. Um, they're not informed about income versus expenses. It might, it might just be, hey, we're busy, right? There's a division of responsibilities and that happens to not be your responsibility at some point in the relationship. Then years go on. And now we're finding that women are not informed and therefore starting to feel more insecure about the household finances. Or you've got years and years of a particular dynamic. Look, that's, that's been someone else's responsibility. I've been doing it this way. I'm not sure how to step in at this stage and change that dynamic. We hear that a lot. And so when you have that type of dilemma in a household or just a, a, a feeling of, I don't know what we have. I wonder if we're doing it right. I don't know if we're saving enough. I'm afraid to ask because I don't want to offend the person who's been handling it for all these years. But at the same time, I really would like some answers. You know, what's the solution? You know, the solution is perhaps when you're starting to feel that way, 
the easiest thing to do is to engage a third party sure. and to bring in an advisor who can mediate that conversation, give you both the space to ask questions, inform one another, and get that clarity. And so you may, you may not be the person in the household managing the finances, but you might love to know how the finances are going. And so a financial advisor can help bring light to that big subject. The other solution is technology, right? When couples are willing to embrace technology, upload information securely, use an aggregator to pull all of their investments, their accounts, their credit cards, bank accounts together in one place, now it's organized. Now, even if a person doesn't feel like they want to manage the money, they can log in somewhere and see a snapshot in real time of exactly where things are and just feel that, that clarity and that confidence that comes with the knowledge of, of okay, you know, according to the app or according to our financial plan, we are on track and we're doing it right. And so I think often engaging with a third party, someone who is not married to you, can really make a difference in that conversation. Absolutely. Excellent point. And also when you think about the, when you talk about the concept of having going online and really uploading certain things to have that data aggregation, and that also has other positive unintended consequences. And when you think about that, in terms of children, a lot of times uh, the adult children may not know all of the assets that the parents have. And sometimes it may be difficult to broach that conversation. How wonderful would it be if you had that one central data point where all of your assets and liabilities and insurance portfolios were listed in one central place for the child. So, excellent. Or even for a spouse. As we've seen countless, countless times this past year with the pandemic of someone's incapacitated, someone is sick for a period of time, for an extended period of time, someone else has to step up and figure out the bill paying, where is everything, what's being taken care of. If you've got a central aggregation tool, gosh, it, it just takes the mystery out of where to even begin in, a, in a, uh, an emergency type of situation or a temporary issue like that. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned family. I find something that we, especially we as women, um, tend to be polite mm -hmm. and um, respectful to, to a fault. And by that I mean um, when it comes to not having transparency in conversations with family members about money. So whether it's with your children, if you're older, or with your elderly parents, if you're a grown up, um, what we see is, and this is an example that just, just happened with a client, you know, I said to her, do you have a sense of your parents' situation? Mm -hmm. Do you know what their financial situation is? Do you know what their, their end of life wishes are? And she said, oh, no, I have no idea. I would hate to bring that subject up. Mm -hmm. And I said, is it uncomfortable for you? She goes, no, I just don't want it to be uncomfortable for my parents. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it would be terrible to talk about death and dying and end of life wishes. I just, I think it's better to not have that conversation. So interestingly, you know, I ended up having, uh, got, getting referred to her parents and having the conversation with them. And I said to her parents, have you had the conversation with your child, your adult children about end of life wishes, your portfolio, your intentions for your beneficiaries? And they said, oh, you know, we'd love to, but we don't want to upset the kids by talking about death and dying. And it, you know, there's one generation who doesn't want to bring up the subject because they don't want to upset someone. And another generation who doesn't want to bring up the same subject for the same reason, sure. and if we could just get everybody at the same kitchen table to have a conversation, the the security and the peace of mind that comes with that, the ability to just be transparent is tremendous and not easy, right? So it takes somebody, I would say it takes bravery, right? Somebody's gotta be courageous enough to begin that conversation. And it might not be in person. So one of the, um, the areas that we advise clients to, to really think about is write a letter mm -hmm. to your parents, send an email and say, look, mom, dad, I, I'm not sure how to bring up this subject. I don't want to offend you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I'm worried. Sure. I don't know where things stand with your assets. I don't know if you're going to be okay. If you're not going to be okay, I want to make sure that we can help you and take care of you. These are the questions that I have. When you're ready, 
I would love to engage in this conversation. If you feel more comfortable emailing me back, please feel free to do so. If you want to sit and have a cup of coffee and have this conversation in person, that could be you know, even more meaningful. But somebody has to step up and kind of be the leader in the family, whether it's the parent or the kid, and just open up the conversation. That could make all the difference. It's, it's a heck of a lot better to have an uncomfortable conversation at the kitchen table with your parents than it is at somebody's hospital bedside when someone's incapacitated and unsure what their wishes were and now you don't know. And now you've got the dynamics of the family and siblings and everyone trying to figure it out. Boy, it wouldn't have been nice to have that clarity in advance. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially to your point when you have multiple siblings. The last thing that you want to do when you're having or you're dealing with an issue with your parents is to have that discord amongst siblings. So what great clarity for the siblings to have to know that mom and dad have spelt out exactly what they want and they've created a financial plan. So that's one thing that the siblings don't have to perhaps figure out. And so when we think about another area, uh, women traditionally tend to be financially underprepared for divorce. And certainly, divorce is a tough subject for most of us. And it is, uh, it's challenging, it can be painful both emotionally and financially. Uh, and as advisors, too often times we're contacted by women who may be thinking about getting a divorce, uh, but they have a limited understanding of the family's household finances. To your point, perhaps that was their spouse's job to do and they really don't have an intimate working knowledge of what the family's household finances are, or if they were to go through with a divorce, what they might need on their own in order to be able to live and survive and run the household. So I really think in terms of women being able to empower themselves, being able to really uh, just claim that ownership uh, of knowing and understanding the family's finances, because again, things can happen. And so in terms of being prepared, in the off chance that one becomes divorced, it really is nice to kind of take control of your, fi of your finances. And when we think about uh, women too frequently, uh, we are referred by someone from a, let's say an accountant or an attorney. And so an accountant or an attorney will refer a client to us. Oftentimes, the client has already met with that attorney and has already finalized or settled their divorce. And now they come to us for financial planning. And one of the things that I found throughout the years is that it really would be beneficial to have the dialogue about finance before the divorce settlement. To be able to get really clear, again, on what the finances are, what you might need, because that can help you in the negotiation when uh, really determining the terms of the settlement. It's a very good point. Yep. And I think the last big subject that's important to cover, it will sound small, but it can really impact a plan is beneficiary designations, mm -hmm. right? So someone gets a new job, they sign up for a 401k plan, they name their mom as the beneficiary if they're young and single, and 20 years goes by, and you've since gotten married, have had children, mom still named the beneficiary, mom might not even be alive anymore. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you don't go back and update your beneficiaries as your life changes and as your situation changes, that can be a big problem in your overall financial plan, especially if something terrible happens to you. So what we suggest, January is a perfect time, right? To take a look at your whole picture, but to look at your beneficiaries, to go back and look at every account, every life insurance policy, um, your bank statements, right? Make sure that someone is named on those accounts, whether it's a TOD registration, which is a transfer on death for your investment accounts, a beneficiary designation for your IRAs, your 401ks, a POD registration, which is um, for your bank accounts. Make sure that those go to someone. It will help avoid probate, which can be a costly and just a lengthy process. Um, but to really think about who's named, I always say, go back and look at your beneficiaries and make sure that who you've named, you still like them. Sure. Right? Sure. Uh, because we've seen this happen where someone passes away unexpectedly and their ex-spouse is still named on a retirement plan, guess who's getting that money, right? Not the new spouse, the ex-spouse. And so just a beneficiary audit, going back and looking at everything, especially at the beginning of the year, is just a good way to double, triple check that 
the people you love the most would be the people who are, are intended for that money um, will actually get it because you've done the work. Absolutely. And it's also a great way in terms of beneficiaries, if you have any social causes or charities that you may want to account for, that's another great reason to do the audit in terms of beneficiary planning. Absolutely. You know, people often just leave their money to their children, right? That either it, because that's how it was set up a long time ago, or you think that's how it's supposed to be. And we often have a conversation with our older clients about philanthropy. And people tend to be pretty generous, charitably minded, and they've given throughout their whole career and throughout retirement, and then they don't put that philanthropy or those philanthropic intentions into their final beneficiary designations. So if you've loved a particular organization your whole life and you leave all of your money to the kids and then hope that the kids will take care of that organization, if it's not clear, if it's not just specifically spelled out, it might not happen. And so the best way for your final wishes to be carried out is if you go back and look at those beneficiaries, hey, do your kids need to be 100% beneficiary? Could they be 90? Mm -hmm. And could your favorite charities, your favorite nonprofits be 10? That could make a gigantic difference over time for a lot of great nonprofits if people were thinking that way. Absolutely. And so just in, in wrapping up this conversation, we could obviously talk about each of these subjects for an hour. Um, what would you have as a final, final recommendations or final guidance for anybody listening? So in closing, I would really say that it's never too late to start planning. If you feel that you are behind the proverbial eight ball, reach out to someone, ask for help, seek the advice and counsel of a financial advisor, because we do know that proper planning really helps not only the individual, but the families alike. And so that was one thing I would mention, sound planning. Also, ask questions about the financial planning process. Uh, when you are, as you mentioned, when you're interviewing or looking for a financial advisor, really think about what you would like to have for your wishes and your needs. And then lastly, small changes can really have a meaningful impact. And if you're thinking about making some changes in your financial plan, it can be easy to become overwhelmed because when you think about all the things that need to be done, it can be daunting for most. But you have to really think about it in making small incremental changes because those things can really add up and can really make for powerful impact in your overall plan. I, I love when you say it's never too late to start because my final thought is it's also never too early to start. And so for those of us who are parents or are going to be parents, it's never too early to start teaching your kids the fundamentals of money. We hear this so often from grown-ups who say, oh, I wish my parents would have taught me this earlier. I wish I would have started saving sooner. I wish I would have understood how to enroll in the 401k. I would have done that in my 20s and not waited till my 30s. So to the extent that parents can start teaching their kids, giving an allowance, showing kids what it means to save for something that they'd like to purchase, or giving kids an allowance and then teaching them that they don't get to keep all of that. Some of it goes to save for the future. Some of it goes to perhaps charitable giving. I mean, we know uh, clients who at as early as age six are teaching their kids about philanthropy and giving and saving for the future, saving for college. So imagine if everyone at age six or seven started getting those fundamental math, money, and finance, um, like educational conversations instilled in them. I just think that the next generation would be far more prepared than, than perhaps many people feel that they are now. So it's never too early and it's never too late. Absolutely. So in closing, one of the things that we wanted to really talk about was women of color and how particularly challenging it's been for us entrepreneurs during this pandemic. And one of the ways that we would really encourage uh, women entrepreneurs is to take advantage of some of the social and governmental programs that are available to be able to help keep your business afloat. And so arm yourself with the knowledge and the education of what's available and what's out there so that you can really take advantage of those programs to be able to have a thriving business and hopefully bridge that gap until we can get to better economic times and come out of the pandemic. Women as entrepreneurs have an extra challenge, right? When you're employed by an employer and you have employee benefits, 
and a pandemic comes, there's more security than if you are self-employed and responsible for the business, yourself, your finances, and your family. Now's the time to put your team together, right? Being a female entrepreneur can feel very lonely. You've got to have a team. So I would recommend if you don't have these key people already in place, here are, here are your top people, a great banking relationship, a great financial advisor who can help advocate for you, a great attorney who can help you think about your business, and certainly a great accountant because taxes are more complicated right now than ever before. And if you're applying for loans and if you're looking for forgiveness for loans, you've now created a much more complicated tax picture than you may have ever had before. So building that team not only will ensure that you're getting the right advice and the right guidance, but it will feel a heck of a lot less lonely if you're doing this with a great, solid group of people around you than trying to do this by yourself. So first, I want to thank the Women's Fund for their creative thinking and coming together so quickly to pull together resources and be such a great advocate for women, for women of color, for entrepreneurs in our community. We've been proud to be a sponsor of this series of conversations and you know from our experience as financial advisors knowledge is powerful money is powerful and really understanding money makes someone feel much more confident in their decision making in their planning and and as they think about the future so it's been a very unusual year to say the least and the more that you can think about the future, plan for what you want rather than what you have right now, I think is um, certainly as women, we, we have hope, we've got the power, and we control more than half the money in this country. So I think now more than ever, as we embark on this new year, this is our time. <music>